Hi, my name is Bernie Spears. Um, I called you earlier, um, but I'm calling again because I just wanted to make sure um, during the process of ending the conservatorship that um, my father threatened me several times that um, he would still take my children away. I just want to be guaranteed that everything will be fine with the process. Amid a media frenzy, the 26-year-old pop star was brought by ambulance to a Los Angeles hospital. Despite every aspect of Britney's personal life being put on display and picked apart in 2007, Britney was dealing with even more behind the scenes that the public and media didn't know about. A very concerning alleged leaked email between Britney and her attorney Gary Stifelman was released, giving us a glimpse into why Britney was so paranoid and struggled to trust anyone including her own family that year. The email from July of 2007 reads, Gary, since you are my lawyer, even though I don't know if you're really trying to protect me or not, but there's this crazy lady, Lou Taylor, that has been sending stuff to my house. How did she get my address and why can't you stop her? I don't know her. She is a stalker. She is really terrifying me and my babies. If she knows where I live, then she can just show up here. She sent me a pink hat and she is writing letters like she is my mother. She has been stalking me since Malibu and it needs to stop because I don't have security. And Sam refuses to stay over every night because he has a thousand dogs to go feed. And I have my babies in London and she keeps saying I'm possessed and that she needs to come and kill these spirits. We told her a million times to leave me alone, and now she's saying she's going to visit my drunk father in Kentwood. I don't care about him, but she could easily find my mother and hurt her. What am I supposed to do when Sam is not here? I'm scared. Can you call him and tell him how important it is that he needs to stay here every night? Because it's like no one is listening to me. And now she sent me pictures of her and a man and butterflies. She is really crazy. Do you care if I'm dead? Because I cannot sign your checks if I am. Your client, Brittany Jean Spears. A fan of Britney's posted the email recently on Instagram calling Lou Taylor Britney's stalker. Lou Taylor decided to respond to this fan, basically confirming the email is real, but stating Britney was not the one who wrote it. Lou said, do you know she did not write the email? Did you look at her post? Seriously, you all are out of control. Then Lou said, did you know twice in court under oath, Sam Lutfi admitted to writing the emails? Seriously. Sam would then immediately send Lou a cease and desist, stating Lou defamed him. Lou saying he admitted to writing that email is false, demanding Lou immediately and permanently delete these comments. And Lou did just that. She deleted every comment that mentioned Sam. The fears outlined in that email that Lou Taylor, Britney's alleged stalker, would begin to weasel her way into Britney's family would come true. By the end of 2007, Lou would be representing both Lynn Spears and Jamie Lynn. As the roughest year of Britney Spears' life comes to a close, 2008 begins with even more hardships. A battered Britney Spears is heading into yet another rough year. And Britney didn't know it yet, but her days as a free woman were numbered. Just one day after New Year's Day, trope and trope Britney's custody attorneys filed to be relieved of duty and left her hanging just before her deposition with Kevin's lawyer relating to her grueling ongoing custody battle. And just one day later was the beginning of a saga of Britney involuntarily turning over her freedom. On January 3rd, after being questioned by Kevin's lawyers, Britney retreated to her gated community, The Summit, where her sons were there with a court-appointed monitor for their regular visit. However, 
hordes of paparazzi were waiting to capture every moment of Britney's private life, even in her gated community. And about six and a half hours passed with her kids, and it's time for them to go back to Kevin, and for Britney to once again be alone with her thoughts and no children to take care of. But just as Kevin's security team arrives to pick up her boys and take them back to his house, they immediately realize there is a major problem as Britney's assistant, Carla, is making up excuses for Britney not immediately turning the children over. Sean was taken out of the house and into the car by the court-appointed monitor before Britney locked herself in her home with Jaden. And just one hour later, police are notified and officers arrive by the monitor, who is still locked outside of the house. But the monitor doesn't have the paperwork to grant them entry into the locked house. At this point, Britney had locked herself in the house with Jaden for two hours and 20 minutes. And Kevin's attorney shows up with the proper paperwork to grant the police entry. And just like that, a drove of police cars enter Britney's gated community. More than 12 police officers, two ambulances, and several fire trucks are stationed outside of Britney's home. At this point, Britney's cousin and friend, Allie Sims, and her assistant, Carla, are both outside of the house, leaving Britney entirely alone with Jaden. And just over an hour later, Britney is removed from her home and strapped to a gurney, but not before the media arrives on the scene. Amid a media frenzy, the 26-year-old pop star was brought by ambulance to a Los Angeles hospital from her Beverly Hills home. Another chapter in her long-running custody battle with ex-husband Kevin Federline over their two sons. As this video provided by Entertainment Tonight and The Insider shows, Spears was taken by stretcher into the emergency room. Her husband, Federline, was at the hospital when she arrived. .com is reporting that Brittany was taken out of her home on a gurney by paramedics and that she is now being taken to a local hospital on what's being called a medical hold, essentially a mental evaluation. <laughs> At this point, Britney Spears is on her way to the hospital, escorted in an ambulance by 13 police cars under blue light sirens. And at 12.30 a.m., Jaden is taken in a separate ambulance to Cedar sinai Medical Center, where Kevin Federline and Mark Vincent Kaplan are waiting in the emergency room. Sam Blutfi even followed the ambulance to the hospital and was initially denied entrance. And just 45 minutes later, Jamie Spears, Britney's father, arrived on the scene. This was a big deal, as the two hadn't seen each other in a approximately eight months after her father sided with Larry Rudolph during their falling out and called Brittany a sick little girl to the media. It was reported that Brittany would be on monitored observation for at least 72 hours. Now, more recently, we've gained even more insight into the situation as a letter allegedly written by Brittany Spears in the third person was leaked to the public by a photographer where Brittany explains no one knows the truth. Her behavior when her children got taken away because of her locking herself in the bathroom is under Understandable, considering her friend at the door kept telling her the cops are leaving, don't worry, stay in the bathroom. She was lied to and set up. Her children were taken away and she did spin out of control, which any mother would in those circumstances. And just a few days after the incident, Lou Taylor got involved and allegedly convinced Brittany's father to have Dr. Phil go to Cedar sinai to see Brittany and convince her to stay in treatment. And Dr. Phil did end up going and speaking to Brittany, but as soon as he did, he went against the family's wishes and released a public statement to the media saying that Britney will be doing a taping about the entire situation. The entire Spears family was feeling betrayed and Lou Taylor, who'd conveniently snuck into the position of Spears family spokesperson, spoke to the media saying, What's wrong with Dr. Phil's statement is that he made a statement. The family basically extended an invitation of trust for him to come in as a resource to support them, not to go out and make public statements. This isn't the only time Lou Taylor has snuck her way into a young and vulnerable celebrity's life, as she also attempted to take control over Lindsay Lohan in 2010. After bailing her out of jail, Lou Taylor came into Lindsay's life as a knight in shining armor. Lou Taylor allegedly formulated a plan with Lindsay's mother, Dina, to take control over her finances and health care for an indefinite amount of time. A source told X17 that Lou has suggested to Dina Lohan that they seek conservatorship over Lindsay's estate. Of course, Lindsay doesn't really have any assets to speak of, 
up, so it would really be for the sole purpose of controlling her future earnings. The problem is, neither Dina nor Michael would ever be granted a conservatorship by a judge, so Lou went searching for someone else to fill that role. Someone with whom she could partner in a business sense. Someone she trusts. This time she thinks Larry Rudolph may be the answer. Lou now realizes choosing Britt's dad as a conservator may not have been the best idea. He got power hungry and decided he didn't need Lou anymore. So this time, Lou thinks Larry might be willing to work her way on this and be a figurehead in Lindsay's career while Lou works behind the scenes. The source expanded on Brittany's situation saying Lou totally brainwashed Jamie. She convinced him a conservatorship was the only way to go and of course he went along with it when he heard about the financial control it would give him. But Lou didn't have Jamie in mind as the conservator at the beginning. She considered suggesting Larry Rudolph but she was afraid he would abuse the power. With Jamie, Lou thought she would have someone who was naive enough that she could continue to influence him and therefore continue to have a direct influence on Britney's life and career for years to come. But Lindsay's father came to her rescue, publicly bashing Lou, saying, since Dina and manager Lou Taylor are going to try to be co-conservators, I had a choice of fighting it or petitioning for the purpose of appointing two conservators who don't have an interest in Lindsay's money, but rather her as a person and human being. Dina and Lou have their hands in it, not their hearts. A lot of the controversy in Lindsay's life wouldn't be there if Lou Taylor and Larry Rudolph weren't part of the equation. I'm trying to make her aware that that her mom and um, and her business manager, her new business manager, Lou Taylor, they're actually trying to put Lindsay in the rehab so they can get a conservatorship over. And Lindsay doesn't even know it. When Lindsay's in the rehab, they're going to move for conservatorship. They want to put her in there. They want to control her finances. They want to control everything that she's doing to people in and out of her life. I want to make one thing clear so you all know this. When Lindsay was supposed to go into Morningstar Rehab, they started to reconstruct everything there for Lindsay to accommodate her. Sean Chapman Holly, Sean and Lou Taylor leaked that to the press because they wanted Lindsay to get out sooner and have her in UCLA so she wouldn't spend much time in the rehab. They're destroying my daughter's life. After being admitted due to the circumstance with her children, Brittany was released from the 5150, as the danger had subsided. But little did Brittany know there was much more danger to come. According to Lynn's tell-all, Jamie and Lou were concocting a plan to file for major documents that would cause Brittany to relinquish her finances, her children, and her freedom as soon as January 22nd. About a week after Brittany was released from the hospital, Kevin was even granted full custody of the children for the month. And Brittany, unfortunately, had no visitation due to the incident that had occurred. And it is important to note, this is still a time in Brittany's life where she has isolated herself. Her circle mainly consisted of Sam Lutfi, Allie, and Adnan Ghibli, her paparazzi boyfriend. However, that circle was getting even smaller as Brittany began to isolate herself even further. And Allie spoke out against Adnan, saying she didn't believe Adnan had good intentions with Brittany. And he was, after all, a paparazzi. The same people who had terrorized her so much and exploited her for every penny they could. Around this time, we also see Felicia Culotta, Brittany's old assistant, express that she wanted to work for Brittany again. However, she was in contact with Lynn, who said Brittany still needed to recover from the traumatic events that had occurred in the years prior. And as January 22nd approached, according to Lynn's tell-all, Lou Taylor and Brittany's father felt God telling them to wait, saying, quiet plans have been underway for six weeks for Jamie to petition the court for temporary conservatorship of Brittany. But it seems like an impossible dream at that point, with Sam still so entrenched in her life. In fact, Jamie was going to file for the conservatorship on January 22nd, eight days beforehand, but he and his business manager, Lou, felt God leading them to wait, fast and pray, despite the frustration of a phalanx of lawyers. But just one week after, everything came to a boiling point. Brittany's family, team, and psychiatrists were beginning to plan an involuntary hold with the LAPD, and Brittany's family staged an intervention at her home. They explained how they were concerned about Sam Lutfi's influence, and coincidentally, on the exact same day, Sam Lutfi's past was exposed by Blender Magazine. A few days later, Sam and Brittany phoned into TMZ, where they say her family just barged in, stating they have an agenda and are jealous they no longer fit into Brittany's life. Brittany did say her and Sam argue, and later that day, Brittany's 
family tried to execute the involuntary hold, but the LAPD were waiting for the paparazzi to leave. But the next day at 1 a.m., the LAPD and LAFD came with an ambulance and Brittany was put on a 5150 hold psychiatric evaluation once again. She went willingly with Sam Lutfi and her parents to UCLA Medical Center, and allegedly Sam and her parents were arguing about her care should she be declared unfit to care for herself. TMZ reported she was taking Adderall and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. We have talked to a lot of people in her world. She has never been formally diagnosed with being bipolar. And Britney's mom, per Britney's lawyer, wanted to take her home to Kentwood, away from Hollywood, where Britney had a good support system and could recover away from whom she deemed as bad influences. However, this wasn't over for Britney. She had been through so much the past two years, and she wasn't going down without a fight. Britney didn't know it yet, but this month would define the next decade of her life and career, as this would be her last month experiencing what little freedom the media left to her to live a normal life. February 1st, 2008 would be the day Britney's estranged father with a history of verbal and alcohol abuse would begin taking total control of her life. Jamie Spears petitioned the Los Angeles Superior Court for appointment of probate conservator over Britney Spears. A probate conservatorship, also referred to as a guardianship in other states, is used for adults who cannot take care of themselves. Usually the conservatee is elderly, has dementia, or is disabled, making Britney Spears not the typical candidate for this type of conservatorship. Conservatorship. The probate court can appoint a conservator of the person, much like a parent caring for a minor child. They manage housing, food, clothing, day-to-day -day activities, and medical care. A conservator of the estate can be appointed who would handle the conservatee's assets and finances or both can be appointed. Along with filing the petition for conservatorship over both Britney Spears' person and estate, Jamie filed for a temporary restraining order against Sam Lutfi. AJ, the claims are absolutely wild and terribly sad and disturbing. They come from Britney Spears' mother, and I can tell you that we now definitely understand why a judge ordered Lutfi to stay away from her, her house, and her family. Sam, why'd you park all the way down here? Those were the good old days for Brittany and Sam. Now, the good old days are over, and a court has ordered Lutfi to stay away from her, thanks to some shocking, absolutely stunning claims from Brittany's parents. The parents literally think that Sam is the root of evil. Oh, it's Brittany. Now, for the first time, Showbiz Tonight brings you the horrifying claims Britney's parents have made under oath against this mysterious figure in Britney's life who seemed to come from out of nowhere. Hey, Sam, what's going on? Claims that Lutfi drugged Britney, cut her phone lines, and that he, quote, purported to take control of her life, home, and finances. Along with granting the temporary restraining order, the court also granted the temporary conservatorship, naming Jamie and Andrew Wallet Jamie's attorney co-conservators of her estate and Jamie, sole conservator of Britney Spears. There would be a hearing only three days later on February 4th to reevaluate. Also on this day, Jamie and his attorneys would take steps to strip Britney of her basic rights. By law, a conservatee is to be notified of the conservatorship hearing five days in advance, which is really important so they can get legal representation before someone takes control of their life. An ex parte application to waive Britney's rights to receive this marriage mandatory notification was filed by Jamie and Judge Reva Goat granted it. Jamie's reasoning was that Britney could be released from her involuntary hold prior to the hearing and Sam Lutfi would be notified, posing a risk to Britney and her estate. However, when Jamie was granted temporary conservatorship, he was given the ability to secure her assets, have round-the-clock security with Britney, change the locks on her home, and access to her medical care. Jamie had the power needed to protect Britney and her estate. Not not giving her the basic right to be notified was the first step taken to try to block Britney from fighting back and keep her in the dark while they worked to take total control. On February 2nd, Ron Rail, Britney's custody attorney, goes to visit Britney at the UCLA Medical Center as the temporary conservatorship would impact her current custody battle. He recommends Adam Streisand, one of the nation's top attorneys handling celebrity estates, to help Britney with the conservatorship. Ron Rail showing up must have put a hole in the plan to keep Britney in the dark because shortly after, Ron received a call from Jamie's attorneys. Adam Streisand immediately sent an email to Jamie's attorney, Geraldine Weil, calling them out on the 
there are ready shady antics. Streisand said, I am told you called Ron Rail and told him that Britney has been adjudged incompetent. That is false and you know it. You further stated that Mr. Rail has no right to see his client without approval from the temporary conservators. That is also false. He then said the conservatorship is nothing more than a hostile takeover of our client for improper purposes. When Jamie's attorney, Geraldine Weil, received that email from Streisand, Britney had not yet had her capacity evaluation that is required by the courts. Geraldine Weil quickly emails Dr. Long, a psychiatrist who had treated Britney in 2007, asking him to do a capacity declaration on Britney Spears. Dr. Long, who appeared to feel uncomfortable doing this evaluation, told Weil the next day on February 3rd that his attorneys informed him not to speak with her. Also on February 3rd, Samuel Ingham, Britney's court-appointed attorney, shows up to UCLA Medical Center to do a brief interview with Britney, but allegedly didn't give her any notice he was coming. This short interview would end up severely impacting Britney's ability to fight her conservatorship. It is the day of the hearing, February 4th, and Brittany is still on an involuntary hold at UCLA, but Adam Streisand is there to represent her. Streisand explains to the judge, Brittany does not want her estranged father as her conservator. And Andrew Wallet, co-conservator, is called into question, stating Andrew doesn't have the expertise to handle a $40 million estate. Then Jamie's attorney questioned if Brittany even had the mental capacity to obtain Streisand as her attorney. Samuel Ingham, Brittany's court-appointed attorney, argued that in his 15-minute interview with her the day prior, she didn't have the capacity to hire direct counsel as she didn't understand the nature of the proceedings. Streisand responded saying he is Britney's lawyer. Judge Reva Goetz then ruled that Britney did not have the capacity to hire an attorney, ejecting Streisand from the courtroom and siding with Sam Ingham, who only stood to financially benefit from Britney being forced to use him as her attorney. Ingham was paid around $405,000 in just 2008 alone from Britney's estate. Britney Spears' father is staying in control of her affairs for the time being. A California judge reportedly rejected a plea from one of the singer's attorneys, challenging Jamie Spears' role as co-conservator. Also a court appearance Monday by Adam Streisand, who said he had been asked by Britney Spears to represent her in the matter. He told the court that Britney doesn't want her father in charge of her welfare, but the court denied the request for Streisand to enter the case on Spears' behalf. This judge yet again made a ruling that stripped Britney of rights every conservatee is supposed to have. Most importantly, the right to choose your own counsel. Britney never stood a chance. She was fully blocked from being able to fight for her basic rights and the empire she built before she was even released from her involuntary hold. What's also really strange is that Jamie's attorneys seemed to know this would be the ruling beforehand, considering they told Ron Rail days prior that Britney was adjudged incompetent. How they knew before the official ruling, before she even had a capacity evaluation, and prior to Sam Ingham's infamous 15-minute interview will forever remain a mystery. Two days later, Brittany is released from the psychiatric unit of the UCLA Medical Center. Jamie and Lynn Spears are really upset, putting out a statement saying the hospital should not have released her. However, the psychiatrist said they simply could not hold her any longer. She was stable. Brittany quickly hops into Adnan's car and she wastes no time heading straight to see attorney Adam Streisand. Okay, hold on. 
challenge the conservatorship, but she was really concerned for her kids. Streisand said he couldn't help because of her being deemed incompetent. While Britney was in the hospital, her father used her children as emotional leverage, asking Britney if she wanted help getting her babies back. Streisand said she started to understand her best shot at seeing her boys was to just accept what was happening to her. The next hearing to evaluate Britney's conservatorship would come and Judge Riva Goat would grant another extension of the conservatorship. Meanwhile, on the same day as the hearing, Britney managed to get on a conference call with attorney John Eardley with the help of a paparazzi friend so Jamie wouldn't find out as he was monitoring all of her calls. OK Magazine got a transcript of the call. Britney said, basically, I want my life back. I want to drive my car. I want to live in my house alone. I want to pick my own security, see who I want to see and make it happen. Attorney Eardley quickly gets to work and submits a motion to move Britney's case from the LA Superior Court to the federal level, citing that her civil rights are being violated. This motion would get a new judge on the case. He explained Britney has not been able to have a single hearing before the court and was stripped of the right to access counsel. She is being completely isolated with absolutely no privacy. She can't make telephone calls, she can't receive or send mail, or drive a vehicle. At this point, Britney has been stripped of almost every right a conservatee should have under California law. Eardley also explained, under the circumstances, Jamie Spears is denying Britney not only her liberty, but the ability to participate in her own custody case. Jamie Spears and Andrew Wallet responded saying this is a brazen but vain attempt to strip a probate court of jurisdiction from an attorney without a client. Attorney Eardley responded in an interview with the Associated Press saying that he is concerned for the emotional and physical safety of Britney under the circumstances. He was asked the last time he consulted with Britney and he said he talked to her a few days ago and someone wrestled the phone away from her and he had not talked to her since. Judge Gutierrez, who was overseeing this motion, ruled that it should stay at the state level because Britney was deemed incapable of hiring an attorney, and Eardley does not have the authority to remove this case. Although Britney was denied yet again from being able to fight the conservatorship, a right she has been denied multiple times at this point, she at least did receive some hopeful news she was finally able to see her boys as she regained visitation with her sons. However, a psychiatrist and her father must be present to monitor the visits. This would give Jamie even more control when it comes to Britney's children. And using that control, the conservatorship would put Britney right back to work with hardly any time to recover after her life has been turned totally upside down. She was on an episode of How I Met Your Mother, Britney was seen going to the recording studio, and the conservatorship even hired back Larry Rudolph, who Britney had made it clear she didn't trust and had fired two times in the past. The next couple of months are quiet as Britney is already beginning to work on her sixth studio album. However, behind the scenes, it appears Lynn Spears is starting to realize she's getting pushed out of her daughter's life. In a series of email leaks, an alleged email from Lynn to Jamie Spears from May 28th, 2008 was also leaked. Lynn says, Jamie, I never thought you would ever make it possible for a court to keep my child's health information from me. Her mother. You know you put your foot down about many things and you could this one too. But once again, it's not important enough to you because it's me. You as a conservator can give your daughter's medical records to her mother to view. Because I am the mother who was there when our children were sick and in the hospital. Where were you? The man you once were would have had no problem in telling those high paid professionals that her mother has ever every right to know her child's health, court or no court. And I'm not the one making money off selling stories to magazines and never will be, if that is the threat they fear. And I know you don't understand those medical terms, you can't even pronounce them correctly, that are in the health document. So get Dr. Saja or someone to interpret it for you. Clearly you need to stay at the house with Brittany until she stabilizes on the new drug. Don't run out on your daughter again when the going gets tough, especially now. You surely are paid enough to put forth the extra effort. Please question your conscience about the real reason you allow me to get pushed out. What would Jesus do? 
Just one day after Lynn Spears sent the aforementioned email, Samuel Ingham, the attorney Britney Spears is being forced to use, was in Judge Riva Goat's chambers for 90 minutes, stating Britney should not participate in her July 31st hearing, saying it would be harmful to her. Judge Goats agreed, stating Britney was on a new medication and her diagnosis had yet to be complete. So at this point, without even a complete diagnosis, Britney Spears is being told yet again that she cannot even appear at her own conservatorship hearings or have her own legal counsel. She is being deemed incompetent. Meanwhile, to the contrary, she has been working, acting, and recording her next album. Britney's team looked at her like she was nothing more than the cash cow. And if she wasn't working, the people around her weren't getting paid. And with a ginormous media storm of her being 5150 twice and put under a conservatorship, all the while she's still recovering from the lasting effects of 2007, Britney's team knew they had to do one thing to earn their paycheck. Hire a PR team, flip her image entirely, and push her harder than they ever had before. This process had already begun during the conservatorship, as when Britney was filming How I Met Your Mother, merely one month after being released from the psychiatric ward, it was rumored that Larry Rudolph began shopping around a reality TV series that would reportedly document Britney's comeback to the music scene. Before Britney even had time to breathe after being 5150'd and thrust into a conservatorship, her team was already wanting to kick her comeback into gear and broadcast every moment for the entire world to see. However, a source also began telling outlets that Jamie was against the idea. He didn't want the world seeing everything that was going on behind the scenes. He needed that veil of secrecy. But the show was going to happen and began filming later that year. Even though she was fighting for her freedom, in true Larry Rudolph fashion, her team was still pushing her career full steam ahead, whether she was ready or not. As we saw with the release of Blackout, Britney didn't do a proper world tour promoting the album. Even though rumors of a Blackout tour were flying as early as October of 2007, the world never saw that tour come to fruition. This was a huge loss as Britney's label and team hadn't seen the same return of investment that her other albums had had, simply because she didn't tour. This made the circus starring Britney Spears that much more important. She would need to promote two major albums across the world while going through personal struggles, legal back and forths within the court system regarding her conservatorship, all while having the media document every second of it. But Britney's team was going to make this tour happen regardless, and step one was her diet. The entertainment industry is known to be cruel when it comes to a performer's weight, and this isn't just the media. This can be people on the inside too. People who are meant to care about you, completely controlling your dieting until you can't think straight. For instance, Dr. Luke, a producer who was heavily involved in the production of Circus, once snapped in 2014 at a then bulimic Kesha after he saw a photo of the singer drinking a Diet Coke, saying, We all get concerned when she is breaking her diet plan. We have seen it happen multiple times almost every day. It is also double concerning when the A-list songwriters and producers are reluctant to give Kesha their songs because of her weight. This was and continues to be the unfortunate reality of the music industry, and Britney Spears was no different. According to Daily Mail, Britney was back to a mere 126 pounds. Headlines would read, I'm lucky to be alive, and in the next statement say, plus her amazing diet secrets. After the stress of her custody battle saw her, quote, tip the scales to 144 pounds. Daily Mail detailed that her expensive health makeover allegedly included $6,400 a month on a nutritionist and diet supplements, $5,180 on a personal trainer, and $2,600 on a private dance choreographer. A source told Closer Magazine she limits herself to 1,400 calories a day, with one cheat day where she'll treat herself. She also changed the way she eats, trying to have only two-thirds of what is on her plate. It's all about portion control and fresh food now, and lots of water and places of Red Bull. This was hard work and wasn't put in place because she was unhealthy. Even when the media trashed her body at the 2007 VMAs, Britney was still toned. She was still more fit than any of the people trashing her. This was purely for cosmetic reasons, and that is Britney's prerogative. However, as we have learned, Britney's choices are oftentimes made for her. This is evidenced even further by Britney being made the face of Bally's in May of that same year. As if that wasn't quick enough, Britney was still recording her sixth studio album. It would be in the same category as Blackout but more lighthearted and pop influenced. Keep in mind, while recording portions of this album, cameras were still following her for the reality show that was going to be released later that year. And at this point, tensions were very high between the Spears family and Sam Lutfi. As Jamie was attempting to gain more control over Britney, Sam and Jamie both signed an agreement stating that Jamie will stop pursuing the temporary restraining order against Sam as long as he agrees to stop contacting Britney. Around the same time, Britney sat down for a Take Two interview with OK Magazine. This interview is very 
very important as we also see Jamie throw some deep, unnecessary jabs Britney's way, saying, I would hope the conservatorship stands until the end of the year, and then we'll sit back and evaluate where we are at that time, where Britney is at that time. Our relationship is new for both of us. She sometimes calls me 50 times a day and asks me things that light my life up. But like all daughters, she is very manipulative and cunning, so she gets what she wants a lot. Keep in mind, Britney is sitting next to him while he's saying all of this. Anytime Britney did press in 2008, she was surrounded by her father or someone her father trusted to make sure she didn't speak out of turn. We see this again in a Rolling Stone interview in September, when the journalist who wrote the article included, when I met Jamie Spears backstage at the VMAs, he shakes my hand and says, take care of my baby. The or else is in plot. A bear of a man with piercing blue eyes, Jamie and the conservatorship lawyers make it difficult to talk in depth to his baby, and interviewing Britney was a rigorously micromanaged process. We were never left alone together, and my questions had to be submitted ahead of time for approval. Acceptable topics included her new album, her boys, and that's about it. Her team said she wouldn't answer anything about the past year and vetoed a question as straightforward as, do you have an opinion on the presidential election? This seemed to be the ground rules for every interview that she did around this time, as the same questions were asked in the OK Magazine article about her kids, her family life, and her album. In the OK interview, Britney said that her album was coming in six to nine months. However, just the next month, she was already recording a music video for the first single off the album, Womanizer. And the music video was released even quicker than that, coming out a little bit over a week since being recorded. Womanizer quickly became one of Britney's most successful songs to date, and she jumped right back in front of the camera to record the circus music video. Around this time, it was announced that Britney Spears would be premiering her highly anticipated reality show as a music documentary on MTV. This documentary would release in conjunction with her new album, Circus, and would feature behind-the-scenes footage of Womanizer, some of the recording of Circus, and the accompanying video, as well as different rehearsals and Britney's day-to-day -day life. And while it was interesting to see Britney and her element working as hard as possible, the majority of people tuned in to hear Britney comment on her personal as that's all the media had been talking about for nearly three years. And now, the state of her conservatorship, something she had refrained from in the circus press tour. And they were treated to the only raw clips in existence of Britney speaking candidly about her conservatorship. For the record began by setting the premise that on the eve of the 2008 MTV Music Awards, Britney Spears invited a film crew into her life. The film you're about to see was captured over the 60 days that followed. No topic was off limits and no question went on answer. And for the first time in nearly a year, Britney had the floor. She began by saying that there is a lot that people don't know about her, and she feels misrepresented. Then it jumps right into her hectic lifestyle, preparing for the VMAs. Britney's team begins discussing the way they keep people in and out of her life. Jamie telling Larry Rudolph that security will be stationed at the door, and Larry responds saying, no one gets through the door without speaking to one of us. We can't have a revolving door. They instruct her that when she accepts her VMA awards, someone will knock on the door, presumably of her private dressing room, and guide her onto the stage. They had it set up so that no one could speak to her. The control of Britney exhibited throughout this documentary is intense, and anytime Jamie enters a room, Britney tenses up and is a completely different person, and anytime he leaves, she relaxes and is her normal bubbly self. She expands on her lifestyle, saying, I never wanted to become one of those prisoner people. I've always wanted to feel free, get in my car, and go and not let people make me feel like I have to stay in my home. Yeah, but there were people in my life that were, that were just bad people. And I was very guarded at first, but then I went to a point where I ended up letting them in because I was lonely or whatever the fact, and I really paid the consequences for that. You know, you do something wrong and you learn from it and you move on, but it's like I'm having to pay for it for a really long time. Britney also confirmed the notion that she didn't care about the business side of her conservatorship. In the last couple of years, things that have happened, not with the, even the business, things that just happened to me personally have been the problem. It was all about her personal life and children. At this point, Britney was alone. She explained how heartbreaking the entire situation was with Kevin. With Kevin, I, because I had two children with him, I did not know what to do with myself. Built my dream home in Malibu, a huge house in the 
a pool and a huge yard for the kids and I did everything for them and just my world was that. Everything was for them. This house was lavish and perfect for the family that Brittany wanted to raise. But now that house was just a lonely reminder of the childhood that was quickly disappearing. I did not want to be at home because like my babies represented home. That was my home with them. And every time I went home, it was like, oh God, I can't be here. Then Brittany gets into how the people around her are taking advantage of her. I'm definitely angry with myself for letting people take advantage of me. I'm um, angry with people for taking advantage of me and for letting it go on for so long. But I have to go on with it. I look at it for what it is and I have to move on with it. She explains how hopeless she is, saying even when you go to jail, you know when you get out. If I wasn't under her strengths that I'm under right now, you know, with all the lawyers and doctors and people analyzing me every day and all that kind of stuff, like if I wasn't there, I'd feel so liberated and feel like myself, kind of stuck in this place and it's like, how do you deal, you know, and you just cope and that's what I do, I just cope with it. Just like you can't really go there in a complete state of happiness because you're scared that it's going to be taken away. So it's better just not to feel anything at all and to have hope than to feel the other way. And when you tell people that and when I tell them the way I feel, it's like they hear me but they really not listening. They're hearing what they want to hear. They're not really listening to what I'm telling them. It's like, it's bad. These clips are among some of the rarest clips in the entirety of Britney's career and have been scrubbed off the internet almost entirely. The documentary is not available on any streaming platform. However, you can buy the limited DVD from a private company on Amazon for $70. The documentary featuring a well thought out Britney someone who is expressing how they felt and explaining the situations going on around them in a very real way is nowhere to be found. It's nearly been erased from history. In fact, when attempting to upload part two of the series, the episode which featured clips of For the Record was completely blocked worldwide. Not copyright claimed, but completely blocked upon automatic review. That means whomever is in charge of distribution of this documentary wants no one to see how truthful, well thought out, and competent Britney really is. The best you'll be able to find are some grainy clips on Daily Motion or some rare HD uploads on sketchy sites. This documentary serves as a rare glimpse into Britney's reality and one of the most obscure and unknown marks in pop culture history. With the documentary being released on November 30th and Britney holding a special screening for the event, Britney's latest album was only two days away from being released. And despite controversy surrounding her song If You See Gay Me, well, the line we bleeped out goes, love me, hate me, all of the boys and girls are begging to, and then she says, if you seek Amy. Doesn't make any sense, does it? It's not supposed to. If you say it quickly, with no space in between the letters, it basically spells out the F word and then me. So it's all the girls and boys are begging to. And now comes the music video, starting and ending with clips from what looks very much like a carbon copy of America's Newsroom. Britney's PR makeover was really kicked into gear, but most of Britney's work during the circus era was ahead of her, as her team was developing a nearly 100 show world tour based around an actual three ring circus to show off the Britney that they had primed for this moment. Britney's team enlisted the help of the best that the industry had to offer. The stage was incredible and the gags would be insane. Britney's team had also enlisted the help of Perez Hilton to open the tour. Perez Hilton talks about professionalism. When is it professional to publicly bash someone who's going through a hard time? Whom had previously trashed Britney in every way possible, but she shot him with a crossbow in the opening sequence, signifying her rise from the tabloids. Nonetheless, Larry Rudolph was quoted saying, the tour would blow people's minds and promises to show Britney's fans something they will never forget. She goes full speed the whole show, about an hour and a half. It's pretty intense. This is a full-blown, full-out Britney Spears show. 
It is a pop extravaganza. It is everything everybody expects from her and more. Nearly months after being 5150 and admitted to a psych ward, Britney's team was pushing her on the biggest tour she'd ever done. Needless to say, Britney would need to rehearse a lot, which is something she's previously said she really enjoys doing, even under Larry and her father's watchful eye. At this time, she still had no phone usage. However, allegedly one day while rehearsing, Britney snuck off to make one of the most important phone calls of her life. Hi, my name is Brittany Steele. Um, I called you earlier. Um, I'm calling you again because I just wanted to make sure I'm um, hearing the positive of ending the conservatorship that um, my father threatened me several times that, um, you know, he'll take my children away. I just want to be guaranteed that everything will be fine with the process of um, you guys taking care of everything and um, things have been the same as far as my um, custody of her. Brittany left this voicemail for attorney John Eardley, the same attorney who tried to help her move her case to the federal level the year prior. When the judge denied his motion and kept it at the state level, he said that Eardley had not yet tried to challenge the probate court's appointment of Samuel Inga, so Eardley was going to do just that. He contacted attorney John Anderson for his expertise, and together they would attempt to help Brittany. On January 27, 2009, attorney Anderson sent a letter to Jamie Spears' attorneys with an ex parte a petition that he was planning to file with the courts on the 29th. They were petitioning for Brittany to finally be able to retain and pay for her own attorneys and to relieve Samuel Ingham, the court-appointed attorney. Since Brittany was so controlled and unable to make phone calls, Sam Lutfi would help Brittany by being the middleman. He would somehow sneak the petition paperwork over to Brittany for her to sign and then get the paperwork back to the attorneys. Jamie's attorneys would then speak with attorney Anderson. They informed him Brittany lacked the capacity to retain counsel and that Eardley had tried to remove the case before but was denied for that reason. Anderson then decided not to file the petition to help Brittany and would have no further involvement in the matter. Three days later, Jamie Spears filed for a restraining order against Adnan, Brittany's ex-boyfriend, Sam Lutfi, and attorney John Eardley. When Sam was acting as the middleman between Brittany and the attorneys, he broke the agreement he made with Jamie back in July of 2008, stating he would cease contact with Brittany. Jamie said upon reviewing phone records, Brittany had spoken with both Adnan and Sam that month. Attorney John Eardley was included due to his connection with Sam Lutfi and his attempts at trying to assist Brittany. The restraining order was granted temporarily with hearings to to follow. At this point, Jamie had successfully obtained restraining orders on the last few people who had spent a year actively trying to get Brittany out of the immensely controlling situation she was in. Ali Sims, Brittany's cousin and previous assistant, spoke up as she hadn't heard from Brittany since the conservatorship started. Ali said, You know they're very controlling, and that's fine. And I just stepped back. I'm not going to fight nine lawyers and parents. Sam Luffy now decided to take legal action against Jamie and Lynn Spears. Jamie Spears had assaulted Sam by sneaking into Britney's house, bypassing her gate and guard, then proceeded to punch Sam in the chest back in January of 2008. And Lynn was being sued for defamation, mainly citing her 2008 declaration and her book, Through the Storm, where Lynn had accused Sam of drugging Britney and not giving her access to phones or cars. But he wouldn't just sue Britney's parents, he would also sue Britney for breach of contract, airing out her personal life from her breaking point in 2007. He was one of the last few people trying to help Britney get out from under her estranged father's thumb, but now he was seeking compensation for the time he was her manager. Although they hadn't met yet, he alleged when Britney infamously shaved her head, it was to avoid drug testing, and that when he agreed to become her manager, he brought drug-sniffing dogs to her house, flushing a powdery white substance. He also stated he helped with the paparazzi so they would stop putting her in dangerous situations. If the paparazzi adhered to their rules, he would text them their location so they could get the pictures they needed. You know, it'd be kind of cool if you guys were able to talk to her. Wouldn't that be cool? No, that'd be cool. If she was able to talk, 27-year-old, can't really speak, well, her doesn't have a cell phone, can't see her friends. Well, uh, don't you think? 27-year-old, touring the whole world? Yeah. No? Well, you know, she's making money for everybody. She's making them. money for everyone but herself, maybe. She's not really concerned with money, you know? Yeah. Brittany's not that type of person, so... Oh, really? Yeah. She's a, she's a normal sweetheart, mother of two, 27-year-old, you know? Very successful superstar. Uh, can't have a phone and go where she wants and see where she Someone's wants. Like, I think that's a little unfair, don't you think? It's almost like slavery, modern day slavery. Don't you think? Almost. Sounds like it. Well, you know, maybe maybe instead of you guys getting your info from other people, you should try to get a hold of her yourself and see what she has to say. I think you guys would be rather uh, 
pretty surprised. If she talked to us, I would definitely feel If she was allowed to. She was allowed I'm sure she would love to talk to you guys. Yeah. But uh, she's not allowed to. Do so you think she's more miserable now than she was back Absolutely. Then? Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. She, must, but she must be going through a lot of hard stuff right now. Then. Well, wouldn't you if you weren't able to go anywhere and do whatever you wanted and govern constantly and you notice there's no friends around, it's just assistants and agents and come on guys, two years of this is a little nonsense, you know? I mean, where they're going to you know, place all the, the everything on these allegations that the parents uh, made about me, which are all false, you know, and I think uh, we'll see that in court soon, you know? Those are horrendous allegations those people made. Um, it's unfortunate circumstances, you know? Talking about drugging people. To the contrary, you know. Uh, so you did not, nothing on the case. God no, never. No. Sam, are you going to do contact with it if, the, if it gets lifted? Or? I uh, I can't answer that, but uh, I wouldn't see why not. She's still a good friend of mine. Hearings for the restraining order case against Adnan, Sam, and Eardley would begin. Brittany's hairdresser said that Sam used her to try to contact Brittany around Christmas time in 2008, but she said Brittany told her that she is scared of Sam Lutfi. Sam's sister, Christina Lutfi, would also testify, saying Brittany told her she fears her father and wants to get out from under his control. She was calling um, that she was, you know, sick of this conservatorship and uh, her dad was controlling and she wants out and she just really wants Sam to find her a new lawyer that she can't even have her own cell phone without them overhearing or controlling everything. I relayed the message to my brother um, to see if he could help her out. He said he'll see what she could, um, he could do, excuse me. Um, and uh, we talked one more time and she asked if I could get her a phone. She told me she'd be at the Peninsula Hotel um, around nine o'clock. When I gave her the phone, she's really like happy and relieved, but also just pretty scared, you know, that the fact that I have to slip her a phone, mm -hmm. you know, um, and her mom can't see her, you know, she, she was scared. So she had to go hide it so no one would see. Blair Burke, an attorney for Jamie Spears, testified under oath saying Britney said she didn't know who Eardley was and did not want him as her attorney. Now, this testimony from Britney's father's attorney makes zero sense considering the phone transcript obtained by OK Magazine from 2008 where Britney is contacting Eardley for help and the leaked 2009 voicemail where she said her father was threatening her. However, the restraining orders were granted for three years. Friedman, Sam's attorney, said in regards to Britney Spears being deemed too incompetent to testify, the conservatorship was misusing a statue meant for the elderly or severely disabled adults to protect a singer who is currently on an international concert tour. One major reason Britney's parents said they needed the conservatorship was to protect Britney from Sam Lutfi and his control, but the conservatorship had now become the very thing they were trying to protect her from. While attorneys were were arguing back in Los Angeles if Britney was incompetent or not, she was embarking on a new relationship with her agent Jason Trawick and her first live tour in five years. The circus tour would not only be her highest grossing tour, bringing in $131 million, but it would be a four-leg international tour with more shows than she had ever done before. The performance, I mean, it was just, it was great. The stage show was she, great. The stage, stage show was, was amazing. Phenomenal. So is Brittany back? It was definitely a circus. It was awesome. Back, <laughs> She's thank definitely you. back. It's Brittany, bitch. Brittany Spears has made her comeback um, 100%. She has... She rocked the house. She is we back. Right if anybody course. thought Brittany wouldn't come back, no. Brittany's back. This, the effects and like the dancers and yeah. the colors and everything was amazing. The costumes. Yes. She brought back all of her old music too for like fans that have known her ever since we've grown up. It was completely amazing. Blue her mind she all changes, the... she has like other stuff going on. It's not just like yeah, it's not boring. You have circus people awesome. running awesome. around, oh going God, to the concert. It's amazing. After Britney's comeback tour ended, she had a two-hour closed-door hearing in regards to her conservatorship for an annual progress report. After two long years fighting her conservatorship, nearly 100 shows touring and promoting circus and promoting her single Three, along with her greatest hits album, Britney's team gave her no breaks and immediately began work on her seventh studio album, Femme Fatale. Several producers who Britney had worked with in the past began hinting to the press in August of 2010 about recording with Britney. A producer named Darkchild being one of the first saying, Britney's fans are going to be so happy in a few weeks. In a minute, I'm going to play some music that I think is the bomb for Britney. 
Britney. Danja, her collaborator on Blackout and Circus, teased Britney's new music as well. We, we're getting things together. I've been, I've been actually doing tracks that I love and uh, I can't wait till we go into full production mode, but more so pre-production than anything. So do you have any idea what direction it's going to be? Is it going to be, you know, the club stuff? Is it going to be, where are you going with it? I mean, you know, we can start one way and end up, you know, uh, a totally different way. I, I really don't know. Um, I'm definitely going to do my part and try to make it hard-hitting, up-tempo, high energy. That's what I think we need and that's what I'm going to shoot for. She's one of the biggest stars in the world, but what's it like to work with her in the studio? I mean, it's so easy and fun and it's, it's one of the easiest, probably the easiest sessions I've had in my career, so I'm looking forward to getting back in. Fans were getting extremely hyped at this point as Britney had been releasing era after era for the past three years and they were about to get another album. However, just two days later, all buzz for the album is killed off by Britney's team with a seemingly threatening statement from Adam Lieber saying, no new music news right now. Wish people wouldn't mislead you guys with BS info. Not cool. P.S. The guys that are working on Brit's next album are not talking about it. And with that, everything went silent for the month of August. However, Britney was still working, as the next month she was featured on an episode of Glee. But with that high, came a major low. As on September 30th, Britney got the news from the judge that Andrew Wallet and Jamie Spears, her father, would remain her conservators and would continue to have full control of her finances and personal life. During the circus era, Britney held out hope. However, all hope was gone. Britney officially had no control. However, her lawyers did give the great news to the courts, saying her mental health had improved dramatically. And interestingly enough, the press began releasing tons of articles featuring photos of Britney smiling and being happy. Some even promoting her clothing line at Kohl's. However, Britney was not happy. Photos of her crying later surfaced from the same day, and the public got a glimpse into how Britney really felt. The facade that Britney's team had created had its first crack since for the record airing, and this was the first of many glimpses into Britney's reality that we saw during the femme fatale era. But like clockwork, Britney's team shifted the focus off of the conservatorship and changed their tune about femme fatale, as just one day later, Adam Lieber officially confirmed there was a new album in the works, and that her upcoming album would be a departure from what you've heard. And just one month after that, Dr. Luke confirms that Britney's album would be coming in early 2011. But just one day before Britney's birthday, Britney's relationship with Jason began being scrutinized by the media, as Star Magazine leaked what they alleged to be Jason Alexander and Britney Spears' voices discussing how she got a black eye. How's your problems with your, uh, fiancé? It's not my fiancé, I just told you what went on with her girlfriend. I thought he proposed to you or something at the beach. Before or after he beat on me? Oh, I don't know. I just, I didn't even know he proposed and I was talking to my mom and she, she was telling me, oh, Brittany's engaged or something. And this was, I think, after you told me about him blanking your eye or whatever, but, uh, I don't know. It's I, not, it's not true. It is true that he did that, but it's not true that I accepted it. And right now we're not together. Go ahead and change my number on him so we're not talking, but he does still work for me. Well, what? He, he was, I thought he wasn't working for you anymore. No, he still works for me. It's just, you know, it's kind of like on the download. I mean, my dad knows about it, but. Right. Well, like, my dad does not want him around me right now. My dad has a shotgun and he's just, just waiting to use it. Radar Online, a publication owned by America Media Incorporated, which also owns Star, doubled down on this, alleging that they had a second recording of Jason and Britney discussing about why she didn't report it to the police. In this recording, Britney responded, because I didn't want the public knowing about it and I didn't want to file anything so everyone could find out. So I just left him and changed my number. Jason asks, so y'all ain't no hanging out no more? And Britney says, no, we're not. Jason says, y'all ain't even talking. And Britney said, no, but I'm going to tell you right now. I found out and um, it'll probably be in a magazine in a couple of weeks. I found out from Larry Rudolph. He told me that my dad is going to fire him because he found out that he had pictures of us, like personal pictures for the paparazzi, and he plans on selling them and acting like we are still together so that he can get money off of it. So my manager, Adam, is probably going to release a statement, probably on Wednesday, saying that the pictures are going to come out. Jason cuts off Britney saying, what are they? And Britney replies saying, they're just pictures of us, you know, hanging out on the boat and acting like we are all happy and this and that. Britney ends this conversation by saying the public doesn't really know that we are not together because I didn't come out and say so. I really don't know who to talk to about it.
The origins of how Radar Online got this phone call is very controversial. However, when Starr subsequently reached out in the same article to Jason Alexander to confirm if it was Britney on the tape or not, against Britney's wishes, he said, Britney is in an abusive relationship. She told me that her life had turned into a nightmare. When asked about the validity of these recordings, Jason Alexander told Starr, I completely stand by my story. This is absolutely my ex-wife Britney Spears on that tape. I grew up with her since I was in fourth grade, and I know what she sounds like. She has been calling me for years. Starr ended this report by saying that Jason Alexander had passed a polygraph test. As soon as this article was published, Britney's team retreated to every media outlet they could find. Larry Rudolph being the first, giving the exclusive to Access Hollywood, saying the story was fabricated and they were planning legal action as lawyers were amassing. A representative for Britney told TMZ, it's so obviously fake as to be laughable. Suffice to say, Jason Trawick has never laid a hand on Britney. They went on to say, the statements attributed to Jason Alexander are a complete fabrication as Britney has not had any form of communication with Mr. Alexander in years. They also called out the tabloids for being irresponsible. He reported the same day Britney was seen showing up to William Morris Endeavor Agency with Jason Trawick and presumably her management team about taking said legal action. And the next day on her birthday, the verified Britney Spears Twitter account tweeted out saying, I'm almost done with my new album and it will be coming out this March. I am an L-O-V-E with it. That was then followed up with, okay, off on a romantic weekend with Jason for my birthday. XOXO Brit. P.S. Star Magazine, Radar Online, Jason Alexander, and the rest of you liars, y'all can kiss my lily white southern Louisiana but that same day, Star Magazine stood its ground, saying they stood by their story that Britney Spears told her ex-husband Jason Alexander that her boyfriend Jason Trawick beat her. In a tapped phone conversation lasting for more than one hour, Miss Spears can be heard repeatedly telling Mr. Alexander how Mr. Trawick went crazy and hit her, giving her a black eye. Mr. Alexander passed the polygraph test administered by Star, where he was specifically asked, did you record a phone conversation that you had with Britney Spears? Despite the back and forth with Britney's team and the media, one thing is for absolute certain, Jason Alexander had told Star Magazine all about Britney's personal life. And as 2010 ended in scandal, Britney was preparing for what would be another busy year for her. 2011 was a monumental year for the music industry. Spotify had just launched in the US, and this completely changed the landscape of music sales and promotion. Katy Perry was still topping the charts, Adele began gaining major notoriety, and Bruno Mars was everywhere. So when Britney and her team were developing Femme Fatale, they knew it had to be innovative. Britney had been working non-stop since her conservatorship began in 2008, and there was no end in sight for Britney as the media began buzzing about her latest project. Project. She's set to drop a still unnamed new album in March of this year, and now we're getting word that the release's first single will hit airwaves on Tuesday, January 11th, and that is official. A little over a week into the new year, Britney released the first single from Femme Fatale, Hold It Against Me, and it was a commercial hit. In fact, later that month, Britney Spears had become only the second artist in the U.S. chart's 52-year history to have more than one single top the chart in its opening week. The Jonas Ackerlund directed Femme Fatale single hit number one on the Hot 100 charts in its first week it was released. Pulled It Against Me was the fourth number one single of Britney's career and would be the first music video shot out of four for Femme Fatale. It was going to be cinematic, high energy, and symbolic. Britney Spears is set to release her heavily anticipated video in just a few days. This Thursday, right before a brand new Jersey Shore, MTV will host the world premiere of Hold It Against Me. I think it's also about sort of Britney, Britney just being strong and still on top. Most of you are loving it and it looks like Britney's back. And most of you said it was further proof that Britney still got it. Looking forward to what we can expect from Britney's new album, Femme Fatale. And of course, we'll be looking to hear from fans to see what you thought of Britney's new video. Oh my God. <laughs> A group of U.S. Marines decided to create a video of themselves lip syncing and dancing to Brits Hold It Against Me. And the video featured Britney surrounded by cameras and microphones. Rising through a cylinder filled with screens of her old music videos, she begins fighting a clone of herself where she eventually collapses. There are really two different Britneys. There's a public Britney and there's a private Britney, and they're very different. Maybe at some times uh, the two Britneys are at odds with each other. Most of the times they're not. Dark Child admitted in a February interview 
about Femme Fatale that Britney was extremely hands-on with this project. And with Max Martin and Dr. Luke confirmed to be a part of Femme Fatale, many considered this the dream team. As at the time, Dr. Luke was producing hits for Kesha and Katy Perry, whom just had one of the most successful albums in American chart history. And while there were hints of that influence in the final project, Britney brought a fully realized aesthetic and sound as she was still working with her longtime collaborator Max Martin. And the second single off of Britney Spears' highly anticipated new album has just been posted on the internet. It's called Till the World Ends. But later that month, Britney's schedule was filling up even more as the official Femme Fatale press tour was to begin. Good morning, America. I'm excited to tell you on Tuesday morning, March 29th, I'll be performing for the first time ever in a special concert in San Francisco's historic Castro District on Good Morning America. And I promise you, it'll be a morning to remember. See you soon. She was recording the Till the World Ends music video, releasing and promoting the new album, and recording a short interview about the album for MTV. However, this interview would be much less personal than for the record, as I Am Femme Fatale was censored around Britney recording the music video for Till the World Ends and preparing for her first big televised performance promoting Femme Fatale. In an effort to illustrate how hard Britney worked on these music video sets, her team unknowingly exposed themselves for showing how hard they push and control every aspect of Britney's life and career. You know, can we wrap this thing up? We're gonna go for 10 minutes and done? Sorry, you have 10 minutes and you're done. You wanna go in there? It's too f***ing hot. The set was, it was a little much. She filmed most of this video in an underground meat plant. It's just like grimy and it was gross and it felt like there was like poop everywhere when there really wasn't. It was just sweat and it was just disgusting sometimes. When I Am Femme Fatale aired on MTV, you see a very well put together Britney. Someone who had been pushed by her team, betrayed by her friends, released four fragrances, three major projects, and nearly 100 shows in the past three years. Earning money she couldn't even control herself, putting on an amazing show. The Femme Fatale press tour also served as a very enlightening era regarding the little to no freedom Britney had to speak her mind. As the process to be able to interview Britney was extensive. Carson Daly revealed this on Twitter when he came for Britney's team saying, I was just told my Britney Spears interview tomorrow on AMP Radio must be pre-recorded and submitted for approval by her management before it can air. F that. Never that restricted. Even when I interviewed Michael Jackson, it wasn't anything like this. It's really insane. Someone called him unprofessional and Carson responded saying, I'm unprofessional faking an entire interview? Just shocked management won't let her do a normal interview. She probably doesn't even know. Stating this had nothing to do with her, just her people. This press tour was a large indicator for where Britney was in her life. So much so that Sam Lutfi used it as evidence for Britney to testify in his case against her conservatorship. Sam Sam had continually fought for Britney to testify in his case. However, Britney's parents had successfully blocked this, deeming her mentally incapable of testifying in the past. However, Sam asked the judge to order a psychiatric evaluation on Britney to prove that she was capable of testifying, and even ordered his own psychiatric evaluation of the Femme Fatale press tour from the UCLA assistant professor of psychiatry, Joshua Pretzky. Joshua is quoted saying, in the Ryan Seacrest interview, Britney Spears is interviewed at length, and she responds logically logically and coherently to questions, evidencing logical thinking and mental competency. The edited interviews in the MTV video documentary also evidence coherent and logical thinking, responsiveness to questions, and mental competence. In my opinion, there is good cause to conduct an independent medical examination to investigate the conservator's claim that Miss Spears is not mentally capable of testifying, and the claim that she was not mentally competent to enter into a binding contract. This wasn't the only lawsuit that cited the femme fatale era for Britney competency, therefore her ability to testify, as Britney's team often used the probate court to avoid situations where Britney would need to testify. An ongoing case against Britney's conservatorship and management for a fragrance deal with Brandsense and Elizabeth Arden had also used this reasoning. Brandsense said that they had set Britney up with Elizabeth Arden, the company distributing her perfume, and were contracted to get a 35% cut of the profits. In that suit, Brandsense alleged that Lou Taylor and Jamie Spears intentionally went behind their back and entered into a secret deal with Elizabeth with Arden, essentially cutting them out of the deal. Forbes reported that because Britney had been declared mentally incompetent, which justified the conservatorship, her father and their attorney were able to keep Britney from being questioned under oath in a deposition for the lawsuit. However, Brandsense fought against this claim, stating in this court document, Brandsense intends to seek immediate relief from the probate court's order. The notion that Britney Spears is mentally or emotionally unfit to testify under oath is a sham. Miss Spears currently has the mental, emotional, and physical capacity to endure the 
strain of a month-long international concert tour, make numerous public appearances, engage in interviews with the media, and participate in numerous promotional campaigns for her various business enterprises and maintain custody of her children. Deeming Britney competent threatens the mere existence of the conservatorship and would essentially put Britney back in control to hire whomever she wanted. So instead of fighting this in court, Britney's conservatorship agreed to settle and allegedly paid Brandsons what they were asking for. This was already shaping up to be an extremely impactful era for Britney. When asked about the goal of Femme Fatale, Larry Rudolph explained, I want them to know, when the fans watch this, I want them to know that Britney is back and better than ever. Not that she's ever gone anywhere, but she's back and she's better than ever. Britney seemed to be nothing more than a product to her team. Like they were marketing a new iPhone. With every era for the past three albums, it was always declared that Britney was back, even though she had never taken more than three years in between each album. On March 25th, Britney released her highly anticipated seventh album, and it was very different for the time. It incorporated elements of dubstep pop, and it had the electro sounds that Will I Am brought to tracks like Big Fat Bass, but also the pop sounds that Dr. Luke and Max Martin specialized in. Now, most of the aforementioned people were thanked in the booklet that came with the album. She started off thanking God and then got into warm thank yous to the team around her. But towards the end of her thank you letter, things went cold. As Britney separated the thank yous, saying professional thank yous go out to Ken Hertz, Seth Lichtenstein, and Tom Hansen for making sure everything is legal, and to Lou Taylor, Lou Taylor, Robin Greenhill, and TriStar for counting my pennies. At this point, Lou Taylor had weaseled her way into every member of the Spears family's lives. A woman who Britney originally labeled a stalker was now Britney's business manager. Subsequently, the last of Britney's charity, the Britney Spears Foundation's funds were allegedly donated to two different charities, one of them being Mercy Ministries, an organization supported by Lou's husband's church, as reported by Roger Friedman of Showbiz 411. If you go to the website of Cavalry Chapel, the church that Lou Taylor's husband is a pastor over, over and go to their missions ministries, Mercy Multiplied, formerly Mercy Ministries, is the first organization on the list. Their website states Mercy Multiplied serves young women who face a combination of life controlling issues such as eating disorders, self drug and alcohol addiction, depression, and unplanned pregnancy. Mercy also serves young women who have been physically and sexually abused, including victims of trafficking. However, a simple Google search will reveal everything you need to know about Mercy Ministries, as several women came forward in 2008 and shared their horrific stories with the Sydney Morning Herald. Nancy Alcorn, the founder and president of Mercy Ministries, is quoted saying, We deal with areas of demonic oppression. If there's demonic activity, like if somebody's opened themselves up to the spirit of lust through, or lots of promiscuous activity or something like that, then we've opened the door for demonic powers and secular psychiatrists want to medicate things like that. But Jesus did not say to medicate a demon. He said to cast them out. And that's supposed to be a part of normal Christianity. Instead of funding children's passion for the performing arts, the money was now going towards Mercy Multiplied. In a March video posted to her website, Britney teased that the Femme Fatale tour was going to be her best tour yet. And with Rihanna's remix of S&M featuring Britney going number one, Britney tirelessly rehearsing with Nicki Minaj as her opening act, she was ready to hit the road. I don't know, we can't wait for the tour. So come on, what, what can we expect? Well, there's a lot of surprises in the show. I think the show is just more me than any show I've ever done. It's just, it's a lot of fun. Have you actually missed being on the road? Yes, I have actually. It's a lifestyle. It's a way of life, definitely. It can be kind of grueling sometimes, but for the most part, it's it's a lot of fun. You know, you're somewhere different every day and you never know what to expect. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. Kind of like a gypsy, you just... Yeah. <laughs> I actually got to sit in the rehearsals, see the whole of the tour being rehearsed in this massive soundstage. Britney would grace the stage performing nearly 22 songs in five different sections themed around powerful women throughout the ages. And to say the stage was elaborate is an understatement. The show was extremely high production and had a storyline throughout. And with nearly 80 shows across four continents, the nearly 700,000 fans who purchased tickets were awed as Britney was in her element. Last night, I had the pleasure of attending Britney Spears. Going to the Femme Fatale tour to see Britney Spears. And I've seen the recent circus tour, which was good, but this felt like a, like a Vegas show. I went to this show expecting, you know, that okay, it was gonna be a good show, kinda like circus, it's a decent show. It was like going to Disneyland and seeing like the fireworks or something, like everything was just flawless. She hit that stage, okay, she hit that stage, and I was so ready for her. 
and this crowd went wild. The highlight was when she comes out with these angel wings and it was um, till the world ends. And Nicki Minaj came out on stage and did like a really sick remix. Yeah, it was pe pe so good. There was a lot going on on stage. She had explosions, there was fireworks, there was fire coming out of different places and there was some sexy ass dancers dancing on some platforms. There was aerialists and the whole deal, right? It would have been a great show from the nosebleeds but right up front it was amazing. I can't get over how beautiful she is. And for all the people that said that Britney was lazy and that Britney wasn't dancing, clearly have not been going to the concerts to watch for themselves. That girl came out and proved everybody wrong. The costumes, the choreography, the dances, just everything was so on point. Like, Britney, you really did put on a show. I came out of that show feeling so happy and I can wholeheartedly say that Britney is back. Needless to say, Femme Fatale was one of Britney's best tours of all time. Not to mention she was doing multiple projects simultaneously while embarking on an extremely elaborate tour across the world. She even released Be In The Mix, the remix volume 2. But as the Femme Fatale tour came to a close, Britney's boyfriend Jason Trawick proposed. And thus, she was now an engaged mother, working harder than she ever had in her life. The Femme Fatale era was a great success, and still has a lasting impact to this day. As TikTok picked the song back up in early 2020 and pushed it to be one of her most liked music videos on YouTube of all time. As 2011 came to a close, reflecting back, Britney worked the entire year and powered through some really tough times. And 2012 would hold major events for Britney. As 2012 began, rumors were swirling about who would judge the next season of Simon Cowell's hit show, The X Factor. After leaving American Idol the previous year, Simon brought his wildly popular UK singing competition show to the US and it was a major success. And with Paula Abdul and Nicole Scherzinger absent from the panel, Simon was on the search for the next major judge that would serve this next season. However, this wasn't an easy task, as being an X Factor judge wasn't just laughing at bad contestants and passing people through the rounds. X Factor judges were mentors to their groups and had to coach them vocally through each round. It didn't just take an eye for talent. You needed to care about your contestants. Not to mention in the early 2010s, singing competition shows were all the rage and The Voice, American Idol, and The X Factor were constantly trying to one-up each other. And with Britney Spears just getting off a huge tour, Simon saw her as an excellent candidate to end the popularity contest. On March 8th, The Hollywood Reporter alleged that Britney had been approached by Simon to be a judge on the panel for $10 million, and that Britney brings legitimacy as a successful recording artist, something critics of The X Factor say was missing in last year's competition, as well as a level of unpredictability and drama that also was largely absent. Jason wanted to be an executive producer on the show to watch over Britney and was reportedly negotiating the deal for her. This wasn't the only step he was taking at this time to gain more control over Britney, as just weeks later, there would be a big change in her conservatorship. But even if Jason and the X Factor came to terms, this wouldn't be an easy contract to sign, as Britney has no freedom and her conservators would need to seek the court's permission before anything could be official. According to Section J of Britney's conservatorship, it is detailed that the conservators have the power and are authorized to pursue opportunities related to professional commitments and activities, including but not limited to performing, recording, videos, tours, TV shows, and other similar activities, as long as they are approved by Britney's medical team. On March 22nd, Britney's team is almost ready to sign the contract for her to become a judge on The X Factor. They would be able to sign on her behalf. However, a source told Radar Magazine that Judge Goats wanted to talk to Britney in person to make sure this is something that she wanted to do and was capable of doing. The judge was extremely impressed and Britney is very, very excited to become a part of Simon Cowell's show. The judge Judge signed off, however, the deal was still not officially signed by Britney. Under terms of contract, Britney would be paid around $15 million a year. This would make her the highest paid panelist on any singing competition show, as she passed Jennifer Lopez's $12 million deal with American Idol. She would travel out of state for auditions as long as it didn't interfere with her custodial time with her sons. And the boys would be allowed to come to the set whenever Britney wanted them there. Her sons were, and still are, her number one 
one priority. At this point, Britney's conservatorship was taking in even more money, but Britney had had enough. On March 30th, Radar reported that Britney had told her psychiatrist and her court-appointed lawyer, Samuel Ingham, that she's now ready to go it alone. Britney has said that she feels she is ready to resume control of her life. She expressed this sentiment on multiple occasions, but her doctor believes that Britney isn't ready for the conservatorship to be lifted. She has come a very long way in the last 18 months especially, but her team wants more time. Yes, Britney does live on her own with Jason, and her dad hasn't lived under the same roof with her for years, but she just wants to be able to call her own shots. Britney doesn't have a problem with the conservatorship staying in place for her business. Remember, she doesn't have any formal custodial rights as far as her children are concerned. Kevin has agreed to essentially joint custody, but in the eyes of the law, she has no rights. And Kevin can revoke the agreement that is in place at any time because of the fact that Britney is still under a conservatorship. Britney was approved to do a live, nationally syndicated television program that was earning her conservatorship $15 million, but wasn't approved to control her own life. And as April began, Britney and her conservatorship were in the spotlight again. A judge has approved Jason Jason Trawick, who is the fiance of Britney Spears, uh, his application to become Britney's co-conservator. But not in managing her assets. That is overseen between her father and another attorney. This new decision now means that the pop star's father and fiance will have legal control over her general well-being. Gerald S. Cohen, a probate attorney of Jamie Spears, was quoted saying, this is a very unusual situation because generally you don't see conservatives get married. Keep in mind, this is before the X Factor deal that Jason was heavily involved in was official, as nothing had been announced yet. Towards April's end, Jason was granted the role of co-conservator to manage Britney's personal affairs. Jason Trawick would be around Britney 24-7, having full control over her day-to-day -day life. Daily Mail even reported that Jason and Jamie would work together to restrict Britney's internet access and that she would have to use Jason's phone if she needed to make a phone call or send a text message so he could monitor her calls. This is again something very unusual with the probate conservatorship, as the rights to receive visitors, telephone calls, and personal mail are classified as a personal right under California law, but in rare instances, these personal rights can be limited by a court order. Robinson and Henry PC wrote in an article about conservator abuse, be wary if there are sudden limitations on contact or personal access to your loved ones. A crooked conservator won't want family members to know what they are up to, and they often arrange for the conservatives isolation to prevent interference. Watch the people involved with the conservatives' case. New attorneys, caregivers, accountants, or helpers are often colluding with the abusing conservator. A man who was accused of putting Britney in harm's way was now working with her father, helping to call the shots. A few weeks after Jason took control and months of speculation about whether Britney would be joining the X Factor panel, it was officially announced that Britney Spears would be joining the show for its second season, and that same month, the auditions process in front of the judges began. This portion of the season was pre-recorded and filmed through July, scouting all the talent that five major cities had to offer. And after filming, Judge Goats wanted to see Britney in person to ask her how she was doing with her new job. Britney said that she's enjoying it and is looking forward to the live show. A source told Radar she admitted that being on the road for auditions wasn't her cup of tea because of the long hours, but it wasn't anything to be concerned about. This news caused a ripple effect within multiple lawsuits Britney's conservatorship was involved in. Previously, Britney's father's legal team and her court-appointed attorney had used the probate court to prevent Britney from testifying in the Sam Lutfi case, citing that Britney wasn't mentally competent to testify as a witness. However, Sam Lutfi told media outlets that if Britney Spears can pull in 15 million to judge X Factor, she sure as hell is competent enough to testify in court and it allegedly even included a DVD of Britney on the X Factor to show that she was in fact competent. However, Judge Goats later ruled that putting Britney on the stand would cause her irreparable harm and immediate danger, and Jason Trawick would testify instead. The same team and judge that both signed off saying Britney was mentally competent enough to be on national live television, judging different contestants in front of millions, had just denied that she was competent competent enough to testify on her own behalf, and still ran with the notion that Britney was unfit to have control over her own life. Something as simple as hopping in her Mercedes to get iced coffee had never been something she could easily do, as the media had taken her freedom in the past years, but now Britney was fighting an entirely new beast, her supposed fiance, the court of law, and her own family. This wasn't just something difficult for her to do, it was something she was not allowed to do. Britney was fighting an uphill battle, and it would only 
get worse. As the X Factor was gearing up to premiere, Britney and Simon Cowell embarked on a press tour to promote the show. I didn't know much about her, and I was fascinated when I watched the show back because there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes where I think you really get to know Britney as a person. And she's fun, has a great sense of humor, and she's got a lot to say about the contestants. But, but the best thing for me is, is that she actually cares about the talent. And I think it's going to be a great mentor. Well, thank you, Simon. But it's true, and I think it's very a, nice. You, it's, you're a great inspiration for them. Well, thank you. Yeah. They were inspiring themselves. And as the X Factor premiered, Britney was the star of the show. She developed a friendship with fellow judge Demi Lovato and was critical but fair. Multiple contestants auditioning had storylines revolving around Britney. As soon as I heard that Britney was going to be a judge, and I knew that I would get the opportunity to stand in front of her and sing. You just feel a connection, right? Yeah, I think she might be my sister. Do I look like her at all? I just need a blonde wig. And I'm like, honestly, I thought about that, but I figured it would be like too creepy. Three years ago, I did a duet with Britney Spears, like 10 years ago. The duet was the most amazing thing for my family and my life. It's the most amazing thing. Hello, what's your name? My name is Don Phillip. Oh my God. <laughs> you know him? I know him. From where? I used to record with him a long, long time ago. Seriously? Really? Like 10 years ago. Like... I never thought I'd see you again. <laughs> Don't cry. Brittany, I love you, honey. I love you, Brittany, beautiful. Brittany, he loves you. Did you love him? I'm scared I'm related to you or something. <laughs> she was well received throughout the show's audience, and when it came time for boot camp, a process where the judges were assigned their own group of contestants, separated by age group, Brittany needed to call in a fellow mentor for the teenage category. She invited none other than her scream and shout collaborator, Will I Am, and the two had great chemistry. With boot camp wrapping up, and you're going home, sweetie. It was nearing the time for the live shows, and Brittany was a hit. However, as the case with Sam Lutfi was thrown out of court, and Brittany crossed into another new year, she released a statement saying, I had an incredible time doing the show and I love the other judges and I am so proud of my teens, but it's time for me to get back into the studio. Watching them all do their thing up on that stage every week made me miss performing so much. I can't wait to get back out there and do what I love most. And like clockwork the same day she left the X Factor, her engagement to now executive producer of the X Factor, Jason Trawick, was called off. That big breakup for the singer Britney Spears, the superstar and her fiance Jason Trawa calling off their engagement just a little over a year after he popped the question. Jason and Brittany have been having their issues for several months, but they put on a good front. Trawick is no longer Spears's co-conservator. He once controlled everything from her finances to her food to her clothing. He immediately resigned as co-conservator, with sources saying that he was only added to the conservatorship during her time on X Factor so he could keep tabs on Britney while she was on set. Britney Spears had made a major impact on pop culture, music, and the way the media Media treats people today. But as she headed into the biggest project of her career, things took a much more public turn. Britney had spoken her truth in private to her team multiple times, and in return, she was stripped of her basic human rights. And her truth was about to explode into a full-blown movement. And no one was prepared for the bombshells that were about to be dropped. All of you who are concerned about me, all is well. My family has been going through a lot of stress and anxiety lately, so I just needed time to deal. But don't worry, I'll be back very soon. She'll be taking up a two-year residency at the Planet Hollywood in Las Vegas. She's been the princess of pop for nearly 20 years. Britney is no stranger to making headlines, but now her father, Jamie, is sounding off about that hashtag, Free Britney. Free Britney. This morning, Britney Spears' father, Jamie, speaking out against the viral campaign, hashtag Free Britney, calling it a joke and a conspiracy. When there's a lot of money involved, nothing would surprise me. They're hoping Britney Spears and the judge will hear them as lawyers went back to the courtroom in the battle over the control of the singer's finances and part of her personal life.